Good afternoon. Uh, the, first, uh, the next item of business is portfolio questions, and portfolios this week is net zero energy and transport. If a member wishes to request a supplementary, they should uh, press the request to speak button during the relevant question or enter uh, the letters RTS uh, in the chat function during the relevant question. I call question number one, Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of the potential impact of the retirement of Hunterson B and Torness on Scotland's CO2 emissions. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Modelling undertaken as part of the analysis underpinning the Climate Change Plan and the Energy Strategy and Just Transition Plan does not show any significant impact to the closure of Hunterson B or Torness nuclear power stations on Scotland's CO2 emissions. Under this modelling, the reduction in electricity generation from nuclear power plants in Scotland has been and will be compensated for by the vast expansion of low-cost renewables and flexible technologies such as storage, but not by fossil fuel plants. Martin Whitford. I am very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. And you will, of course, be aware that Sweden, which, like Scotland, has deployed both wind and hydropower, has now reversed its nuclear phase-out policy and is planning to build new nuclear stations as part of its robust low-carbon mix. Sweden's power is 40 times cleaner, has the lowest electricity sector carbon emissions of any EU country. So can I press the Cabinet Secretary to use his influence on whoever should lead the next administration to drop the opposition to nuclear power and build on the current baseload we have? And of course, I can remind the Chamber that Scotland took 30% of its power from nuclear energy in 2021, not 97% of the renewables, as has in the past been claimed. Shouldn't Scotland follow the Swedish model for cleaner, reliable and cheaper energy? Or alternatively, if the Cabinet Secretary is not minded to influence those that will follow the First Minister, how are we going to do this? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Zain Officer, um, uh, our position in terms of uh, traditional uh, fission nuclear power has not changed as set out within the energy strategy, which is out for consultation at the present moment. And we have set out very clearly how we will meet our energy needs between now and 2045, which is a ramping up of renewable energy, plus alongside using a new, new technologies such as carbon capture uh, and also other sources of uh, storage, which are all starting to develop and progress here in Scotland, which will provide us with the capacity that we require for our energy needs going forward. I can't particularly comment on uh, the position that Sweden have taken in these matters, but if the member wants to look at what's happening right here, right now in Scotland, for example, today at this present time, about over 60 per cent of our electricity is coming from renewable sources. Uh, and there are times when it is significantly higher than that. What we want to do is to build on that good progress and to make sure that we get the economic benefits that go along with that. A supplementary, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, Lord Deben of the Climate Change Committee said he welcomed the UK Government's recent commitment to nuclear and its role in helping us achieve net zero. Yet, as we've just heard, the Scottish Government sets its face against this technology and refuses to acknowledge its part in decarbonising Scotland's future. What gives the Cabinet Secretary such confidence that he and his threadbare energy strategy are right and the Climate Change Committee is wrong? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, uh, there's a, a considerable amount of uh, research and evidence that underpins our energy strategy, which a member, I'm sure, uh, will recognise. And it demonstrates that we are very much blessed here in Scotland with having significant natural resources, particularly renewable resources, which will meet our energy needs going forward. But of course, the member and his colleagues are great advocates of the way in which we should deliver nuclear energy in the future is through small modular reactors, which they think are going to be the the life-saving change that will provide this base load in the future. The reality is that SMRs don't even have approval uh, and are many years away from even getting technological approval. And the fact that they could actually even provide any generation in this decade is highly unlikely in itself. So they've wed themselves to a technology that is not even approved for use yet and is likely not to be even delivering any energy in this decade alone, which is why we need to move on with the technologies which are on the market, which meet our climate change needs and will deliver the base load capacity we require in the future. And start to mention Mark Ruston. Nuclear power is costly and leaves a long and toxic legacy behind for future generations to come. Given nuclear generation costs double the price of offshore wind, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it not only makes environmental sense to focus our investment on truly renewable energy options, but it also makes economic sense as well? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, Senator Officer, members need to recognise that when it comes to traditional nuclear generation, it does present uh, serious waste and environmental uh, concerns. And the costs which are associated with that have to be built into the price, which consumers then have to pay back over many, many decades, in some cases hundreds of years. That's why, for example, if you look at nuclear power, it is very poor value for consumers. The contract for difference figures show that electricity generated by Hinkley, C, uh, Hinkley Point C uh, is based at 92.50 pence uh, per megawatt hour, whereas electricity generated from uh, the latest offshore wind sites is priced at 39.65 uh, pence per, per megawatt hour, significantly lower. So the problem with actually having a greater reliance on nuclear energy is it pushes up customers' prices. It makes it more expensive for them as a result. And if you look at what has been invested here in the UK, that is exactly what it will do. Not only create the environmental and waste legacy problems which consumers have to pay for, but advocates of it are actually advocating higher prices for consumers going forward because it is a much more expensive form of electricity to produce. Question number two, Jamie Halker Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government how it engages with local communities to ensure their transport needs are met. Minister Jenny Goldruth. The Scottish Government engages with communities on a variety of different transport matters. I co-chair the National Transport Strategy Delivery Board with Councillor McGregor on COSLA, which also co-produced our route map for reduction in car kilometres. The second strategic projects review uh, received 14,000 ideas from stakeholders right across the country, which were refined into the final 45 recommendations. And in December, the draft long-term plan for vessels and ports was published and shared with stakeholders and will go into public consultation in the coming months. Jamie Halker Johnson. Uh, thank you. The Minister will be, will be aware that it has been announced that the Corran Narrows crossing will have a further restrictions placed on what is already a restricted service, one which is being covered by a 47-year-old reserve vessel because of refit delays to a 23-year-old vessel. This is a route that, even before the latest issues, was at breaking point. And as well as the impact on local residents and visitors, any new restrictions would mean significant additional costs for the many businesses that operate locally. This is our crisis, so can the Minister advise me what discussions she's had with Highland Council about these latest restrictions and what support the Scottish Government has been able to offer? And given the wider issues facing local ferry services in my region, can the Minister also advise me when she was first made aware that the reopening of Uig Harbour would be delayed, whether she was required to sign off that decision, and if so, when she did? Minister. I thank the member for his question. He, he knows that I have engaged with the Highland Council on this matter and, of course, directly with the member. Uh, additionally, I think I have also undertaken to, to visit uh, and to meet with locally elected members to see the ferry for myself. Of course, we have engaged with, uh, with the Highland Council um, and, in relation to the discussions that are ongoing this week, my officials are going to be providing me with further advice later this week. On the point he asked in relation to UIG, I was informed about that development, I think, on Wednesday of this week. Uh, I was not required as Minister to sign off on it, as some of the delays there have related to weather impacts, but he will be well versed in the situation at UIG. I do believe that the mitigation we were able to bring to that um, effect on the local community was a better solution than that was which uh, originally planned. But in relation more broadly to some of the challenges, I am committed to working with the member and the Highland Council um, in finding a suitable mitigation, recognising some of the challenges pre presented by the age of the vessel uh, that he has cited today. Supplementary, Alistair Allen. Uh, transport agencies like HIAL and companies like Logan Air clearly have a key role in ensuring that the voice of local communities are heard. Uh, does the Minister agree that both organisations need to listen to island communities more attentively than they have in recent days when many lifeline uh, air services have been cancelled for weeks on end? Minister. Yes, broadly I do. I mean, obviously, as I think we heard in the Chamber earlier this week, Presiding Officer, the, the focus for government ministers is very much on addressing the underlying issue, which is to settle the high pay dispute. And I know how concerning the suspension of services is for communities' impact, and I very much recognise the importance of these routes. I met with Logan Air this morning, and I asked them to restore services earlier than the 1st of May, should a settlement to Hyle uh, be reached this week. Now, ministers have approved, of course, a new proposal from Hyle, and it's now sitting with the Hyle board to negotiate a settlement with the unions as timidly as possible. And supplementary, Peter Swishuk. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Minister will be aware that I wrote to her earlier this week about Logan Air's announcement that they intend to reduce services between Inverness and Island airports. For Shetland, the ability to get to the mainland is further reduced because currently one of Circo Northlink's vessel is on its annual refit, so it's in dry dock. 
What assessment has the Minister made on the reduction of services and Islanders' transport needs in this situation? Minister. I have been assured that um, Islanders' needs will be met by the current provision. However, I have yet to have sight of Ms. Be uh, Ms. Wishart's correspondence. I am more than happy to speak to her directly on this matter, recognising the very real impacts for the community that she serves. Question number three, not large. Question number four, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government will it provide an update on the continued repair works to the M8 motorway in Glasgow, including, including their financial implications. Minister Jennifer Ruth. Uh, the M8 Woodside Viaducts are a vital element of the motorway serving Glasgow and Scotland. Their repairs are extremely complex and are being delivered on an operational motorway that is used by approximately 150,000 vehicles daily. Works to install props at 23 separate locations are programmed for completion for late 2024, when lane restrictions on the M8 can be removed. Temporary works are well underway. The final design costs and programme for the permanent repairs will be informed by a trial repair being undertaken this summer and officials in the contractor are exploring options to reduce timescales. Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is well over a year since the works on the Woodside Viaducts have begun, yet there has been absolutely no consultation with Glaswegians and the costs look set to surpass the £100 million mark by the time of completion, the biggest infrastructure spend in Glasgow this year. These temporary repair works might be necessary in the short term, but given our commitment to reducing climate emissions and promoting active and public transport options, can I ask the Minister if she will commit today to ensuring that before any new permanent works are commissioned, the Government will undertake a full public consultation exercise that examines the viability of this viaduct and looks at alternative options and international examples for how it may be replaced in the longer term. Minister. Um, I thank the member for this question. I've been out to visit, actually, and to, to learn a bit more about the, the really complicated works that are ongoing on the M8 at the current time. And I just remind the member that the decision to restrict traffic lanes at that time was taken for safety reasons, um, because, of course, reducing the live traffic loading on the structure was a really key aspect to that management. Now, Demolishing the structure itself in relation to the member's suggestion around about alternatives was ruled out, of course, due to some of the impacts that that would have had on local businesses. I think the member spoke about a lack of consultation. That's not been my experience thus far of the works, but if the member would like to share more detail on that with me, I'd be more than happy to take that up with Transport Scotland. And just in relation to the project costs, of course, those will remain under continuous review. The overall repair estimate is not yet available because the design is not yet complete, and that will be informed by the repair trial uh, in the summer of 2023. Supplementary John Mason. Thank you. Uh, I fully agree that uh, we should be reducing uh, car miles and we need a just transition in due course. But the M8 is absolutely essential to my constituents and many others, not just in the west of Scotland, but beyond. It's important for business, it's important for tourism, it's important for the residents. Can the Minister assure us that she is fully committed to the M8? Minister. I agree with the sentiment of the, the member's question. Keeping the M8 in Glasgow operational is really vital to ensure that communities such as those in Mr Mason's constituency can continue to operate. And I think particularly in the current financial climate, that's quite important. The Government absolutely remains committed to working with the Council. I met actually with Glasgow City Council on this matter earlier today on bringing about those more positive environmental changes for the city. And I think more broadly in line with our policy to reduce vehicle kilometres travel by 20% by 2030, the Council has funding uh, awards of over £43 million pounds to deliver a wide range of active travel projects. Those include, of course, connecting Woodside, and that has seen a 300% increase in cycling and the York Hill Cycling Village. But the Glasgow Bus Partnership too has been a awarded £3.6 million pounds from our bus partnership fund to implement and investigate bus priority in the city region. And I know the local authority is really keen to take some of that work forward at pace. Question number five, Alec Murray. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting local authorities to invest in bus services. Minister. New Transport Act powers brought in in June of last year provide local authorities with the powers to run their own bus services. Further legislation on partnerships and franchising is expected by the end of this year to provide further delivery options for local bus services. The Scottish Government allocated £410 million in 2023 to support bus services and concessionary travel across Scotland. The Bus Partnership and the Community Bus Fund are designed to complement those new powers and support local councils' investment. Alec Riley. President Officer, I have no doubt the Government recognises the importance of bus services, having made the welcome move to give under-22s free bus travel. I am, however, struggling to find a national strategy to get more people onto buses. Specifically, can I suggest that the cost is a barrier for, for low-income families? We see bus fares capped at £2 a journey in England and in Greater Manchester. The Mayor has achieved significant investment that means fares are capped and bus usage has increased by 10 per cent over the last few months. 
So what is the plan for Scotland? What is the government going to do to make bus travel more affordable for low-income families? Minister. I think more broadly to the member's point, I think we've discussed this uh, in previous uh, portfolio questions, presiding officer. And I'm sympathetic to the point um, the member makes, particularly in relation to affordability. That's why I reconvened the bus task force last year and we're working uh, with the sector to try and improve affordability because we know that bus is the most affordable form of public transport. I think it's also important to remember when we compare Scotland to other parts of the UK that Scotland's provision of support to the bus sector differs markedly from other parts of the UK. So, for example, uh, we have the most generous concessionary travel scheme in the UK. We invest over £300 million annually to provide free bus travel to over 2 million people in Scotland. That doesn't exist in any other part of the UK in the same way. We also provided over £223 million of emergency funding to support the bus sector throughout the pandemic. And more broadly, we've been able to provide additionality in terms of our funding for uh, bus partnership work. But I think the member's point around about affordability is a fair one. That's why I'm keen to take this forward with the bus task force, with the bus operators who deliver services on the ground. Uh, supplementary Co-Cab Stewart, who's joining us online. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I met with the Chief Executive of SBT last week in my constituency of Glasgow Kelvin. One of the primary concerns was the chronic shortage of bus drivers affecting bus operators the length and breadth of the country. Uh, could the Minister outline what support it is providing regarding recruitment and retention of bus drivers to alleviate some of the pressures that are faced by bus services um, and the ones they're experiencing? Thank Thank you. Minister. Uh, I thank the, the member for her question. I met with SPT myself, I think, two weeks ago now, and they raised similar challenges with me. And as the member will be aware, there is a, a current shortage of drivers for buses, which is, of course, being exacerbated by Brexit, which is preventing people from coming to Scotland from the EU to work freely. And we have repeatedly sought a formal role in determining what occupations are in the shortage occupation list for devolved nations. Unfortunately, that has not yet materialised in relation to the UK government. So bus drivers are not included in the shortage occupation list. I do understand the UK government will be reviewing that and we, will, we have asked for full involvement in that process. We're also working with operators, as I mentioned in my response to Mr Rowley, um, and partners right across the public sector to promote the bus sector as a place to work, while recognising that many of the levers, of course, remain reserved to the UK government for the current time. And I call new Bibby. Bus services are on the brink of collapse across Scotland. McGill's are planning 13 per cent cuts to services in Renfrewshire and in Reclyde alone. The government needs to intervene to protect services and cap fares now, but there could be no more blank checks for private operators. There needs to be conditions attached to provide commercial information necessary to take local buses back under public control. We can't go on like this and we can't afford to wait for action. Labour believes the government should provide franchising powers, guidance and devolve resources to local transport authorities to make this happen urgently. What will the Minister do now? to bring local buses under local control. Minister. I thank the member for his question and I understand very much the sentiment of that question. I think there is a challenge to government currently in relation to the way in which we fund the bus sector and how that can be sustainable into the future given that most operators in Scotland are privately owned. I think there is a need for greater conditionality. Of course there is a level of conditionality attached to uh, NSG funding in relation to fares being capped at a certain level. Now the Transport Act gives operators a number of powers including of course um, bus franchising and there will be secondary legislation legislation coming forward on that later this year. I think there are great opportunities to work with our operators to that end, and I continue to work with our operators directly through the bus task force. Question number six, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what plans it has to introduce free rail travel for companions of deaf-blind people. Minister. Uh, I confirmed to Parliament last December that the current fares arrangements for companions accompanying visually impaired NEC plus one card holders on rail journeys would be reviewed as part of the Scottish Government's ongoing fair fares review, which is being undertaken to ensure that we have a sustainable and integrated approach to public transport fares, one that supports the long-term viability of our public transport system. That review will be published later this year with the launch of a public consultation on a draft vision for public transport, which will give people the opportunity to shape the future of public transport in Scotland. Rona Mackay. I thank the Minister for that answer. Deafblind Scotland headquarters is in my constituency, and this is the most concerning issue they raised with me. The cost is prohibitive for blind or partially sighted people to travel on the train because their essential companion has to pay. I understand it's free on some routes, but presently there's no national standard fare structure for communicators. So does the Minister agree that ending geographical inequalities would benefit users and rail staff? 
Minister. Uh, yes, I, I do accept the premise of Ms Mackay's question. Um, as I think I alluded to in my original answer, um, I responded to a member's debate on this very topic last year. I accept the points that are made by the member, um, and I think Mr Simpson actually led a member's debate on this last year in a similar vein. The varying level that we have of discounted real travel provided by local councils in the existing scheme can, of course, lead to a level of confusion for passengers and staff alike. That's why I've asked my officials in Transport Scotland to consider the details of all of that as part of our Fair Fares review, which, of course, we'll report later this year. Question number seven, Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I apologise for being just slightly late to the start of the session. Um, to ask the Scottish Government whether it has plans to extend free bus travel to everyone under the age of 26. Minister. The Scottish Government's concessionary bus travel schemes are the most generous in the UK, with over 2 million people across Scotland now eligible for free bus travel. The Under-26 Concessionary Fares Review, which published in, uh, in September of last year, considered options to extend concessionary travel for those aged under 26. It recognised that extending concessionary travel in this way would have obvious implications uh, in relation to affordability. The Scottish Government has no plans at the current time to extend the concessionary travel scheme further to people under 26. Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the Minister for that answer and say, given the cost of living crisis, which many students in particular are now facing, they don't qualify for the under-22 bus pass, and having met them, they are now struggling to cope financially, as for some of them, getting to college or university or part-time work too can mean that they are paying in the region of £40 to £50 pounds a week as a minimum, and that's just for bus travel. So will she commit to consider the issue further, talk to NUS Scotland, to understand the barriers that many students face, because it's not just paying out now, it's an investment in future and getting young people to commit to being on public transport for the future, and that can only be good for our bus services and our climate. Minister. Um, I am sympathetic to the point the member raises, and I think she has asked me a number of written parliamentary questions on this matter, additionally. Um, more broadly, I am more than happy to meet with NUS on, on this matter. Um, as I outlined, I think, in my response to Mr Rowley, we do provide significant levels of funding and support to our bus operators in Scotland, who are largely privately owned. And I think it's important that the member reflects on that point, given that this is public money. However, I think it's also worthwhile saying that every college and university has a discretionary fund, and that is intended to give assistance to students who experience financial difficulties. So um, I would encourage uh, the member to engage, of course, directly with the colleges and universities, perhaps via University of Scotland. But each institution ultimately is responsible for deciding which students should receive payments from that fund. So there may be an opportunity via that route. But I'm more than happy to meet with the member or with the NUS on this issue. But I just highlight the considerable financial support this government already provides to the bus sector, investing, for example, £3 million annually to give free bus travel to over 2 million people. Supplementary, Jim Fairley. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, it appears that the Labour Party have been out of power for so long that they have forgotten that really good ideas like that need to be paid for. So does the Minister agree with me that if the Labour Party want to see progressive entitlements extended to more people, then they have got to get behind the position of this Parliament having all the powers of independence so that they can deliver these good ideas? Well, Minister. I very much agree with the sentiment of uh, Mr Bailey's question. And obviously, as I've mentioned in responses to, to other members this afternoon, Presiding Officer, our concessionary travel schemes are making bus travel more affordable. They are helping people to access education, leisure and work. And we're enabling children and young people to travel sustainably early in their lives while cutting transport emissions. That's something I would think every party in this chamber would welcome. And supplementary, Billy Rennie. I'm very concerned about young people being able to access the free bus travel in rural areas. There's bus operators like Muffet and Williamson are making a decision about whether to buy new buses, and they're concerned that the electric buses won't be able to service rural communities. If they buy a diesel bus, can they be guaranteed they'll be able to use it for the full lifetime of the bus? Minister. I thank the, the member for his question. In relation to more rural operators, I think he cites Muffet and Williamson, who were, of course, one of the operators I used when I was at school in Fife many moons ago. Um, this was a challenge in relation to some of our Scots Ev funding at the last funding round, and as a result of that, I asked Transport Scotland to um, adapt the scheme that we had to make it more suitable for smaller rural operators. So, in the summer of last year, I announced an additional £500,000 through the Zero Emission Bus Market Transition Scheme to help smaller operators like Muffet and Williamson access some of our decarbonisation funding. Now, if Muffet and Williamson have not been able to access that, I'm more than happy to speak to the member directly and to provide what assistance my officials in Transport Scotland can or I can as Transport Minister. 
And question number eight, Douglas Thompson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will remove its presumption against oil and gas from its draft energy strategy and just transition plan in the event that it receives significant feedback in favour of such a move. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the draft energy strategy and just transition plan is open to public consultation until the 9th of May. And we welcome views from a broad spectrum of respondents as uh, possible. Uh, at this stage, we are not preempting those responses. Uh, the draft strategy clearly sets out the oil and gas available for extraction from the waters off the coast of Scotland is a declining resource and irrespective of the climate imperative as an already established mature basin in gradual decline, planning for a just transition to our net zero energy system and securing alternative employment and economic opportunities for workers is essential. Scotland's energy transition transformation is therefore urgent and inevitable. Dr. Slumson. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. David Whitehouse, the Chief Executive of Offshore Energies UK, has warned that Scotland will be £6 billion a year poorer by 2030 if the devolved government press ahead with the draft energy strategy and an acceleration away from oil and gas production. This will have a devastating impact, not just to the North East economy, but Scotland as a whole, with less money for the NHS, less money for teachers, and less money for the most vulnerable in society. So will the Cabinet Secretary commit to work with the industry to avoid such a catastrophic damage to our economy? Cabinet Secretary. Absolutely, and also, um, I actually discussed this very issue with David Whitehouse um, earlier on uh, this week, and of course the figure he's referring to are actually the figures that we've set out in our assessment of the mature nature of the North Sea oil basin and the need for a just transition. So the figures are uh, not unfamiliar to us. Uh, the challenge is in recognising that it is a mature basin and that it will be in decline or is in decline uh, and that we will see jobs being lost is a question in which we ramp up the deployment of renewables in order to support the transition into clean green energy. And that's exactly what we've set out in our draft energy strategy. What I can assure the member is that during the course of this consultation period and once we receive all of those consultation responses, including I hope the member's uh, own response to the consultation, given his apparent stated interest in this issue, is that we will take a a, we will take an approach which is for, informed on the basis of evidence in supporting the approach we take. And I have no doubt that the member will want to set out, uh, that out in his own submission to the consultation. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions. There will be a short pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow frontbench teams to change positions should they wish. Thank you.